This is 9-11 Free Talk. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Free Fall. My name is Andy Steele, and I am the host. Tonight, we'll be joined by structural engineer Larry Cooper and AE 9-11 Truth board member and civil engineer Roland Angle. They're going to be talking about the presentation that Roland did near the Forensic Engineering Conference in Austin recently at the end of November. Uh, very good stuff. A lot of great outreach taking place. You're going to hear about it all tonight. That's coming your way right now. The views expressed on this show by guests and the hosts on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Larry Cooper is a structural engineer. He has 40 plus years of consulting engineering experience related to the structural design and construction of major wastewater treatment facilities and highway and railway bridges. He's joined by Roland Angle. Roland graduated from the University of California, Berkeley with a BS in civil engineering. He served in the U.S. Army Special Forces where he was trained for the use of explosives and became a licensed civil engineer in California. His 50 years of engineering experience has included designing and testing of blast-hardened missile launch facilities and designing U.S. naval explosive containers, harbor terminal facilities, uh, earth foundation systems, and hydraulic systems. In addition, Roland has owned three construction companies and has taught engineering subjects to high school students. He's a board member for AE 911 Truth. He's also the head of Project Due Diligence, uh, we'll be talking about a little bit today, but guys, welcome back to 9-11 Free Fall. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Andy. Glad to be here. So please just remind our audience in terms of yourselves and the 9-11 evidence and your experience. We'll start with Larry. What from your background really drew you into this issue and for you, what evidence seemed the most important? Well, my involvement with uh, architects and engineers uh, started in uh, 2014. When I happened uh, upon a booth that uh, Architects and Engineers was sponsoring at a uh, general assembly that I was attending, and I um, stopped in to pay a visit to see what they were all about, and it didn't take very long. The uh, person manning the booth there uh, showed me a video of the collapse of Building 7, and we had a little discussion, and my immediate reaction upon seeing that uh, video was that looks like controlled demolition. And uh, that, of course, was just the tip of the iceberg that uh, caused me to uh, delve into it a little bit deeper. And and I r- soon realized there was a, a lot more evidence, and it all pointed toward the same conclusion. So I thereupon decided Architects and Engineers was an organization that warranted uh, my support and contacted them, and that was the beginning of my um, connection with architects and engineers and uh, after they researched my uh, credentials and confirmed that I did in fact have a master's degree in structural engineering they added me as an endorser and have been uh, supporting uh, since then and of course um, as of several months ago joined uh, Roland in uh, participating in Project Due Diligence. Roland, just for new people, just remind us what drew you into the movement, what you considered to be the most important evidence that really lit a fire under you to put you where you are now with AE 911 Truth. I heard uh, Richard Gage on the radio uh, in about 2006, and uh, he was talking about the fact that uh, there was a lot of evidence that pointed to uh, controlled demolition. So I went out and heard him he happens to 
at that time he was living in the same area that I am here in the East Bay in California. And I went out to one of his presentations and he presented some very convincing evidence uh, that the only way those buildings could have come down in that fashion was controlled demolition. And, and from what I knew about structures and explosives and so on and so forth, it made perfect sense to me. I had been aware of it, the issue before then, but I had been wrapped up in my own personal affairs and didn't really have that much time to pay attention to it. But as things began to clear up for me, I, I uh, became more involved. I signed the petition. They verified my credentials and... Shortly thereafter, well, I guess it was a couple of years later, they came to me and asked me if I wanted to be on uh, a video that they were making uh, experts speak out. So I appeared in that video, and then uh, I sort of dropped away from the scene for a while, doing other things. And then a, a few years ago, uh, Richard called me up and asked me if I would like to be on the board. They needed more engineer. Uh, presence on the board, uh, and it had been unbalanced uh, towards architecture for some time. So I said, "Well, what would you want me to do?" And he said, "Well, we want to. We want you to bring the engineering community into this debate on a on a bigger scale." So I came on board, and in time, developed this notion of reaching out to the ASCE. Uh, individual branches. They have 160 branches across the U.S. And I said, we, we should go to each one of those branches. I don't think that they're really aware of the uh, content of the NIST and FEMA reports, uh, which comprise thousands and thousands of pages. And I just don't believe that the average engineer has had time to go through that. And uh, I think if they knew what the position of the ASC was, that the uh, existing reports are okay, uh, they might uh, change their mind. Certainly it was convincing to me. And so they put me together with some of the other engineers that have been doing research on the NIST reports. We put together this presentation, uh, which critiques the reports. And now we've begun to uh, outreach to the ASCE branches, and also, we've also started going out to the National Society of Professional Engineers, to their local chapters. So our job is to take this information to them and see if we can get them to help us call for a new investigation. Can you please describe to the audience what the Forensic Engineering Conference is, uh, why engineers go to these kinds of conferences, and what they typically talk about at them? We were very fortunate to have with us... Uh, Two, uh, two other uh, volunteers, uh, Jeff Bishop, who's a structural engineer down in Texas, and also Ozzie Rendon Herrera, who is a retired professor of engineering in Mississippi, and he was one of the founders of the original forensic conferences. They've only had eight. This was the eighth forensic congress that ASCE has held, and they only hold them every three years. And a, uh, Ozzie was one of the persons that initiated the Forensic Congress idea amongst ASCE. And it's a very important subject for engineers because it's an examination of uh, structural and other types of failures that have occurred with an eye towards understanding why they occurred and how they could be prevented in the future. So he was very experienced uh, and knowledgeable about a lot of the people that were there that were leading the conference he had brought many of them into the Congress himself uh, in the past, and he was uh, instrumental in helping us understand uh, their proceedings and their background. So we were very lucky to have him there. We didn't find out about the Congress. Uh, we found out about the Congress through uh, Larry, actually, who notified us a couple of months beforehand that it was going to take place. And so we decided we would go, even though it was kind of the last minute. We didn't present a paper for acceptance uh, and presentation at the Congress because we didn't find out in time. So we decided to hold our presentation at a nearby hotel. We couldn't get a room in the same hotel, and so we got a, a hotel nearby. We got a meeting room there. We published uh, a flyer uh, advertising the event, 
and we went to the Congress the first night and passed it out amongst uh, the majority of the uh, attendees. There was about roughly 300 people in attendance. We got out about 175 flyers and mixed there at the reception. And uh, then uh, went the next morning, attended some of the conference uh, um, workshops, and then held our own presentation that Friday night at a hotel nearby, the Hotel Indigo. So that was our uh, plan, and that was our, uh, our motive in going, to present this information to uh, a lot of people that are directly concerned and involved with the issue of studying failures and analyzing them and coming to conclusions about why they occurred and adopting measures to prevent them in the future. Now, Larry, it's interesting that you were the one who had the idea first, the very nucleus of this whole project, to do something in correlation with this conference. Uh, Do you feel that forensic engineers, that engineers in general, are exposed to this topic enough? I mean, how much... Do you feel, from what you see, that you and your peers really get any education on what happened at the World Trade Center on that day? Well, that's quite interesting because uh, we did have uh, discussions with uh, quite a few of the people that were attending this uh, Congress, and it was interesting that uh, uh, several of them uh, indicated that they were involved in the uh, original FEMA investigation into the uh, the, the cause of, uh, well, into the, the failure of the buildings. And in the discussions that we had with them, I was, uh, it became pretty clear that uh, they really uh, were not um, wanting to side with us. And when we probed the uh, reasons for uh, their resistance, I guess you'd call it, um, they really didn't come up with any technical explanations. They didn't dispute any of the factual information that architects and engineers um, was presenting. Um, It seemed to be more a matter of, well, our fellow engineers um, uh, made some decisions back in 2000. Uh, 5, 2008, when the reports were done, uh, and they were basically just supporting uh, them uh, without questioning uh, the evidence. So it's it told me that engineers are just as human as a lot of other people. Uh, they they kind of want to go with the crowd. They're not comfortable uh, stepping back and saying, well, hey, maybe I ought to take another look at this and draw my own conclusions. Uh, That didn't seem to be happening. So they seem to be just uh, wanting to support the original work and not really scrutinizing it, uh, scrutinizing the, uh, uh, the evidence itself which is rather disappointing. How common is it? I mean, you know, there's other things that happen in the world. I mean, there was a skyway that collapsed in Kansas City in, I think it was 79, if I'm correct, Uh, and that ended up being the engineer's fault or the engineering company's fault. But uh, engineers weigh in on this. Engineers would talk about it for years afterwards, and it gets cited in engineering classes as an example of what you don't want to happen. And there'll be other things that'll happen where people more freely would opine, at least I would think so, when you're involved in a field that has so much science involved with it. You know, science is all about collaboration and input and an open, transparent setting. Uh, So how often is it that you have a circumstance where a group of engineers makes a determination and then almost uniformly, other than the engineers that have signed the AE 911 Truth petition or the ones that uh, may have some reason to support us but not sign it. Other than that subset, uh, all, the, all the other ones go along with it almost as a political stance, saying, well, we support the original determination of that team. 
I mean, is that a common thing to have happen, or is that unique to 9-11? Uh, no, I think it's quite common. I've been in other involved in other controversial issues that are rather uncomfortable for people to confront and recognize. And, and I think that probably uh, it's that uh, phenomenon that I think is uh, going on here because when you look at the evidence uh, as to what caused the collapse of the buildings, uh, it's really quite discomforting. The conclusions that you're likely to come to are quite discomforting, and, it, and those conclusions have major implications. Uh, and uh, I think psychologically it's difficult for people to accept those conclusions because then they have to, they have to reckon with uh, some very serious uh, implications, and um, so uh, I think there's some interesting psychology going on here, where when people are find themselves in a position um, where the evidence points to uncomfortable conclusions, uh, the try to dismiss the evidence or just say, well, there must be more to this. There's, I can't accept the conclusions that this is leading me to, so uh, I'm going to deny it. Basically, they don't come right out and say that, but that's basically what they're doing. So, uh, <laughs> so that's my, that's my, psychological analysis as an engineer. <laughs> well, there you go. No, it's very interesting. I mean, I think that uh, in the future, they're going to write a lot about this time in history and some of the dynamics mm -hmm. going on in our society around it, even within the engineering field. Roland, uh, you may have mentioned this or touched on it before, but I want to draw it out a little more. Uh, why did we do... The presentation near the conference, as opposed to at it. Did you try to get it presented at the conference? And if so, what was the reaction of the people putting it on? We didn't try to get into the conference because by the time we got project due diligence organized and uh, up and running, the deadline for presenting uh, possible workshops at the conference had already passed. As I said, we didn't find out about it till maybe a couple of months before the Congress was scheduled, and it was too late to present anything. So we didn't even attempt to. However, we did run into some of the organizers of the conference uh, while we were there, and their uh, attitude was that uh, I was told right to my face, uh, you're in the wrong place. And I said, well, I don't think I'm in the wrong place. These are people that are trained and educated to understand the material that we are presenting and therefore that's why we're reaching out to them and furthermore that's not the reaction I'm getting from the vast majority of people that I am talking to who all express some interest and none of them deny that this is a relevant subject for this particular body to examine. I, our experience so far, not only at this conference, but with Project Due Diligence in general, is that the further up the chain of command we go in the ASCE, the more resistance there is to us being able to discuss this information with the members. And I think that grows naturally out of the fact that there were a number of prominent people in the ASCE organization that were involved in the uh, investigation of the original uh, crime scene and the publication of various uh, papers that explained, uh, purported to explain what had happened. So they have uh, a, an interest in this uh, and an interest in um, supporting the existing uh, story. So we weren't surprised by that attitude from the leadership, but we are attempting to go beyond the leadership and go directly to the rank and file because we feel like if we can get the opportunity to present this information to them, as we found out at our presentation, there were a number of people that came from the from the uh, 
conference, the Congress, and they came to our presentation, and, and the, nobody raised any objections to the uh, information that we have presented. There's just, we have yet to find anybody that will confront any of the facts that we are presenting in, in an effective or scientific way and uh, dispel uh, the evidence that we're presenting. So it's a question of history and where the ASCE found itself uh, after the event and what they did at that time. Yeah, and I think you guys did it in a very smart way. I think having it separate from the conference but near it and, and drawing people from the conference, that way you can get the right audience, but you're in a situation that uh, you don't have to deal with interference from people who want to keep the issue stifled. So I want to hear it from both of you. We'll start with Roland, though. There was obviously a mingling period during the event that you guys held. What was your impression? Describe some of the interactions that you had there. Well, I didn't have a chance to explain or uh, discuss uh, anything. Uh, there was a general discussion period afterwards, but nobody raised any technical issues. One fellow raised a technical issue. He asked if the steel... Uh, that had been salvaged had been tested and did it meet the specifications and the answer to that was yes it had been tested and yes it was all at or above the specification for the steel so that is not an issue it wasn't a problem with the steel material itself uh, I have called uh, off of the sign-up sheet that we had I've been calling the people that signed the sign-up sheet and I've spoken with a number of the engineers that came from the conference and they all agree that the information was effective was well presented was compelling and certainly was more than enough reason to call for a new investigation and we talked about what we thought the hesitation was uh, in terms of them being willing to confront the issue and uh, they one fellow in particular owns a forensic engineering architectural engineering firm in Dallas, and he was quite uh, experienced in this particular field. And he said, whenever there's a failure, there's always going to be a controversy because the people that designed and built it are going to have a vested interest in uh, defending its integrity. And the people who are concerned about uh, the effects of the failure, perhaps loss of life, property, expenses and so on they have the interest in finding out what actually happened as a forensic engineer he said you always have to step into the middle of those two parties and behave objectively and not let their individual interests sway you in terms of how you're going to interpret the evidence and i think that's true in this case as well there was the uh, the government was responsible for conducting the investigation and they were investigating a uh, failure of massive proportions and they uh, were not the actual uh, organization that should have been conducting that information because there were government agencies and that were implicated uh, for instance the military and their job to protect us had somehow fallen through uh, so it was improper in the first place for an agency of the government to be investigating the uh, failure of the buildings. It should have been done by an independent agency, such as they do with airplane crashes. So um, that was a problem from the very beginning. You had a partisan investigative body, and uh, their partisan nature showed up in the way that they uh, conducted their investigation, unfortunately. So... I think, you know, for people that are interested in this field, they are aware that there's always going to be two sides to the issue, and your job is to be impartial. I think in this case, the NIST investigations failed in that regard. Larry, same question. Your overall impression of interactions and Q&A time during the event at the hotel. Yeah, I'll... Uh... Let me speak more to a discussion that I had with an engineer that was uh, attended that event prior to the uh, to Roland's uh, uh, presentation. Um, 
Because he was, um, oh, I, I don't recall his exact title, but he was a, um, he was in the, uh, in the armed services. He was uh, had a very responsible position at a uh, base. Uh, uh, may have been somewhere in Texas there, and his. Um, uh, I don't recall just why, but in the course of the conversation, uh, he did mention that uh, you know, the uh, war in Iraq, and uh, he was uh, quite fortunate that he didn't. Uh, uh, he did not end up going to Iraq, but many of his um, colleagues, um, his people that uh, were responsible to him did get sent to Iraq, um, but he was designated as someone who was uh, critically needed at the base he was there. Uh, it obviously had a huge impact on him because uh, uh, he lost uh, a lot of people he knew. Um, so he did comment that he did not believe that there was a uh, he didn't believe in conspiracy uh, as being related or having anything to do with uh, what happened to the Twin Towers. And we basically just left it at that. But I guess by virtue of the fact that he brought up, uh, and and I guess it is, I mean, it's a simple matter of historical fact that after 9-11, uh, several things changed. Uh, several things happened. Now, just what the connections are, that remains to be seen yet. But the war in Iraq was something that did happen. And I think many people would argue that uh, were it not for 9-11, that probably wouldn't have happened. Now, what the cause and effect is, that's something that remains to be determined. So there is, and I think maybe that speaks a little bit to the uh, what people don't want to talk about, what people don't want to recognize, uh, that's some of those huge implications that are going on there. So it's it's in the back of the minds of many people. Uh, but getting into that is something that uh, we have to, first of all, get through with the establishment of what did, in fact, cause the collapse of the World Trade Center buildings and and then uh, having established that, then, of course, we move on to how was it done, who did it, and, and so on. So anyhow, I just I bring that up as a sort of a subtle indication that there are some serious uh, uh, implications uh, between uh, the collapse of those buildings and a lot of other things that subsequently happened. So I imagine that the volunteers and, and yourselves had advertised this thing pretty well at the event, and then a certain number of people came up. When the people came up, did they seem to have a overall interest in the topic, or was it more just kind of a curiosity to them? Did they seem to have been exposed to this before and want to learn more, or were they completely in the dark? Like, what was your overall impression of the opening feel of the audience? I think that they came, I think there were mixed emotions. I, did, I didn't talk to all of them, but I think from what I did talk about, these were people that were either open to uh, another uh, explanation than the one that they were aware of, or they were skeptical of the original explanation. I think that there were a couple of people that came that were, probably convinced that they could poke holes in our argument and that they would be able to easily dissuade us from our uh, misguided uh, uh, understanding of what had happened. I spoke with a couple of people like that at the, uh, at the event the night before, but they immediately went to things like, well, somebody would have talked, how did they keep it a secret, questions like that. Uh, unfortunately, as engineers, they fail to understand that those questions are not an area of our expertise. We can't speak to those issues as engineers. We can only speak to the evidence. And as soon as you begin to talk to the evidence, well, you say, 
Well, let's look at the evidence. There were explosives found in the residue, in the dust. And so then the question they come back with is, well, how could that have happened? Well, again, not not of our um, it's not our purvey. We we we're not into understanding how the explosives were planted or any of that business. That's a criminal investigator's uh, job to perform. We simply note the fact that since explosives were found in the dust, there must have been explosives in the building, and leave it at that. That's as far as we want to go with it as, as uh, the engineering profession. We simply want to say there were explosives. There was an investigation to uh, examine those explosives. Therefore, we have done that investigation. We've done our due diligence. We examined the dust. We found explosive residue. It wasn't done in the original investigation. That is a problem with the original investigation and the reports that came out of that investigation. So that's why the investigation needs to be done again. Uh, if you stick to the facts like that, the arguments don't really, they don't really go very far because most of the people that are, think that they're arguing with you are not arguing about engineering facts. They're arguing about uh, criminal elements or economic motives or other kinds of issues that are not of our concern. It's interesting, people who are attending a forensic engineering conference would fall into that kind of thinking, oh, somebody would have talked, uh, how could this actually happen? Yeah, the same thing that most average people will fall into when you discuss this with them. When really, of course, when you're investigating a crime like this, you just got to stick to the facts, as Roland has said. Uh, Roland, I know that our audience and, and you are very familiar with the evidence, but could you just talk about some of the main points that you felt really drove it home to these newcomers to a presentation like that? I don't know if you were gauging people's faces during it, but what do you think really stuck in their minds from your own impression? Well, talking about Building 7 first, very briefly, we have shown that the initiating event that NIST claims set off the building failure could not possibly have happened. And there are four, at least four good reasons for why that couldn't have happened. And they involve the fact that NIST misrepresented the uh, condition that they said led to the failure. They said that uh, the beams were heated and they pushed a girder off of its seat. Well, we've shown that even if the beams were heated to the temperature that they said they were, they couldn't have expanded enough to push the girder off of its seat. They misrepresented the seat itself, the dimensions of the seat. They shortened it to make it appear as if the girder could have come off the seat. They left off stiffeners at the end of the girder that would have prevented the lower flange from failing, even if it had been able to be pushed off the seat. They left off stiffener plates at the column that would have prevented the girder from moving off of its seat. They left off the studs on top of the girder that secured it to the uh, concrete, which would have prevented it from moving independently of the floor and being pushed off of its seat. So there's all kinds of reasons, physical reasons, that the initiating event could not possibly have happened. Those are indisputable. Those, those are just facts. That's mechanics of materials. That's uh, accurate depiction of the uh, condition that we started with. NIST failed uh, in, in those areas. So in the very beginning, the initiating event couldn't have occurred. If the initiating event couldn't have occurred, well, then the entire building wouldn't have, have failed. So you've got to have something that starts it. Their starting event, we've proven, couldn't possibly have happened. Then they said that girder fell down and knocked the girder below it off, uh, off the column and led to a cascade of floors all the way down to the fifth floor, from the 13th floor, and and we proved that that couldn't possibly have happened either. The, the girder falling couldn't have knocked the girder below it off of its seat and led to a cascade. So the cascade couldn't have occurred. And then they said that that, that cascade of floors led to a buckling of that column, and that column then led, buckling led to the column, uh, columns adjacent to it buckling, and all the Four columns failed, 
and that in turn caused the exterior exterior columns to fail, and and that led to the global collapse of the building. Well, all those things, because the initiating event couldn't have occurred, and because the cascading floors couldn't have occurred, we even showed that the column, uh, according to their own information, wasn't unsupported for a length enough to cause that column to buckle. So the column couldn't have buckled. So their whole chain of events uh, was proven to be uh, impossible according to the physical data and according to their own information. So that completely disproves their theory and calls for uh, a new investigation that would involve uh, the examination that possibly explosives were used. As far as the towers go, the main, the main event that uh, occurred, that uh, their initiating event, they said, was caused by the failure of some exterior columns after the planes had hit and the fires had burned for a while, that some of the columns uh, on the exterior of the building failed, and then uh, that worked its way around the exterior of the building, and all the columns on the exterior failed, and that then caused the uh, interior columns to fail and the buildings to collapse. But unfortunately, the video evidence shows that the core columns had to fail first because the antenna on top of building one descended before the exterior of the building began to uh, descend. So that means that the core columns failed first, and that uh, completely disproves their collapse initiation theory. And they don't want to touch that because they don't have any explanation for why the core columns would have failed first because there was very little damage done to the core columns by the plane impacts or the burning fuel. So it seemed as if they were running away from the evidence to uh, come up with a conclusion that was totally contrary to the evidence. And so there are other things. There's lots of other details that we went into, but those that's the main story. Their, their story doesn't work. Doesn't It's not supported by the evidence and uh, it needs to be redone. Now, before I did this interview today, I was talking to our director of strategy, Ted Walter, and he mentioned that there was a workshop on first impression myopia, and we weren't sure which members of your team actually attended it. I, can I ask you guys right now, did you guys attend that workshop? Uh, Larry, yes, I did. Larry, yeah. Larry tell us about uh, that. Uh, yeah, I attended that, and uh, I found it uh, very apropos to what uh, uh, what our work is about. And uh, the speaker was uh, right on target with a number of things. The, the title of that session was uh, Building Failure Investigations, First Impression Myopia. And uh, uh, he made several very relevant statements, uh, like uh, warning us, uh, of deliberate or unconscious confirmation bias, of selective information sharing, of dishonesty, etc. He noted that as investigators are conducting their investigation, they generally form an initial theory as to the cause of the problem, and he then emphasized the importance of keeping your mind open to changing your initial theory if new information leads you in another direction. So don't allow your investigation to be, and don't allow your investigation to be restricted by your client. Um, avoid disaster uh, by obtaining a second opinion and be willing to admit mistakes. So during the Q&A session, um, I uh, reminded the uh, attendees there, which I would say was probably about 40 people, uh, that uh, we were making, uh, Roland was going to be making this presentation that evening, uh, and that it was uh, very much related to the uh, a number of points that the speaker had just uh, brought up in that session. And so I encouraged everyone to uh, to uh, attend uh, our presentation that evening. And I specifically, after the Q&A session was uh, over with, uh, I spoke with the speaker himself and asked him if he would attend uh, uh, Roland's uh, presentation that evening. And he informed me uh, right off that he disagreed with 
the position of architects and engineers, implying, of course, that he was not interested in attending uh, presentation. And I said, well, that's okay, but I hope that you would still attend and that you would share your thoughts and your criticism with us. Uh, I mean, we're about finding the truth. And if there is, if you see any faults, any flaws, you disagree with anything that uh, uh, that's being presented, we want to hear about it. Um, well, he did not show up. You can present to people the information, and people can say they disagree, and then you ask them specifically, what about the official story do you feel supports their claims? You ask them basically for the specifics of the official story, and people won't even know it. And it's not that they have any limited mental capacity or anything like that. It's just they haven't taken the time to study it to get into why the official story doesn't make any sense. They just assume that somebody has looked at this, a team has looked at this, come to a conclusion that what... Roland and Larry are presenting is just out of bounds. It just can't possibly be true. So whatever this team appointed by the government has said has to be true and the benefit of the doubt should go to them. But most people, when you talk to them, don't even know the official story that they are defending. I just want to know, I mean, because we get so many people who will say, oh, we need to be out there protesting in front of Washington, D.C., or we need to be, and we do these things, but, you know, we need to be approaching the president and and confronting him about this issue, and they may say that, you know, we've reached out to institutions before, and it's uh, not effective, or it's not important enough, you know, we need to, to do these bigger and bolder, more dramatic things. I disagree, and I know why I disagree, but I want to hear it from you, Roland. Why is it important that we keep up with the strategy and keep injecting the 9-11 evidence into professional events like this forensic engineering conference? Speaking as an engineer, I'm first and foremost concerned about the uh, reputation and the effectiveness of the engineering community. Engineers can't afford to be wrong. We're not given that luxury. When we are wrong, we have to find out why we're wrong, and we have to take action to correct our errors. That hasn't been done here, and this is a tragic case that affected the lives of virtually every person on the planet. So it is even greater importance that we examine this issue thoroughly. And what we're finding, for the reasons you've been discussing, is is kind of this remarkable uh, lack of curiosity about this event. Uh, when I use this example because my father was at stationed on a ship at Pearl Harbor. After the Pearl Harbor attack, there were no fewer than five congressional investigations into what had caused the failure and who was responsible. And, in fact... Eventually, the head of the Naval Command and the head of the Army Command were both pushed out as a result of what was considered to be their dereliction of duty. We've had no such thing with 9-11, no such thing at all. And our profession, the engineering profession, was smack dab in the middle of this because we were the ones that designed the buildings. We were responsible for the safety of the people who were using the buildings, The buck stops with us. And essentially what the government has found out is pointing the finger at us and saying that we didn't do our job properly because those towers were designed to take a hit from a commercial aircraft and survive. And Building 7 was certainly designed to withstand normal office fires. Yet they all fell down, and we are the ones who are on the hook for that. It is remarkable that our profession is not standing up for itself and ex- demanding a complete and thorough investigation because if if we are indeed responsible, we need to own up to it. I don't believe we are. I think we have been made scapegoat in this affair, and I'm not willing to be that scapegoat. I didn't devote 50 years of my life to this practice to be held up as a scapegoat for the world to uh, blame for this incident, which changed all of our lives. So more than ever engineers cannot afford to be wrong and if we are wrong we need to find out why we were wrong 
We haven't found out anything about why we were wrong here. We have found instead a report that seeks to cover up the actual evidence. Therefore, we must demand a new investigation, and it has to be done properly. It doesn't meet our standards. Larry, same question. Why is it important that we keep up with the strategy and keep injecting the 9-11 evidence into these kinds of professional conferences? Well, I think Roland just described very uh, was an excellent description of the responsibilities of the engineering community. Um, and I guess I would uh, um, speak to something that goes beyond that because this... Uh, uh, As I mentioned, I've been involved in other controversial issues, and and they happen to be related to the Middle East. And um, the uh, things that have happened in the world since 9-11, as Roland said, have impacted everybody in the world. Um, And when I hear discussions um, about... uh, uh, that come back to 9-11 when politicians, for example, or world leaders are uh, discussing things that, and and they somehow make, for some reason, make reference to 9-11, the underlying assumption is that the buildings fell down because they were hit by planes and caught on fire. Well, as Roland has very well pointed out, that is false. That was not the cause of collapse of those buildings. So there is much more going on here than what is openly being openly discussed. And that has huge implications for society, for world, well, societies around the world. Uh, engineers tend to be, for the most part, tend to be non-political, non-activist. They're generally technically oriented. They want to solve technical problems. But when we are being used, as Roland said, as uh, scapegoats, um, we need to speak up because um, what's happened here has uh, implications that go way beyond the engineering world. And that's to get into that, that requires another investigation uh, because the clearly the culprits, if you will, have not really been identified. There's been a misidentification of who caused the collapse of these buildings. So until we really identify the real cause of the collapse of those buildings, that means there are people, forces, organizations, whatever, special interests uh, that are, have not been held to account yet. And um, they still have an agenda, but they're working. Just what that all is, that's another investigation. That's right, but again, we've established exactly what did not happen. These buildings did not collapse because of random office fires we can make the case, and we're going to have a study coming out pretty soon in the case of Building 7, that there had to have been pre-planted explosives and this story doesn't make any sense. So even if you can't make sense of the official story or if the official story doesn't pass the smell test, you still have to throw it out and look into it again. And we're not going to let the apathy of passing time and new events dissuade us or keep us off our mission of constantly shining a light on this event because I don't care how much time passes, even if it's another 10 years from now and it gets acknowledged that there are explosives in these buildings, it'll be a huge deal. It'll be a big eye-opening moment for all of America. And they know that. That's why they put so much effort into trying to dissuade people from listening to us. And that's all we're asking for is for people to listen to us and make their own determinations. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty confident that when they watch Building 7 fall, they'll agree with the need for a new investigation. I just want to make a, a quick comment and pass my respect out to our great volunteers here at AE911 Truth, the people who helped out uh, Roland down there. We have some of our best ones. I just want to know, Roland, if somebody has an idea, you know, Larry had this idea. He saw this conference coming up. Uh, There might be something else that we're not thinking of or some event that we might want to do something 
similar at? First of all, would we consider doing something similar at another type of event? And if somebody has an idea, what would be the best thing for them to do? That's a very great question. And I would like to, before I get into it, thank all the many volunteers that helped pull off this presence at the Congress, of which there were a number that showed up. And that leads me to the next question about conferences of this kind and how we can use them. I think uh, I, my thinking has developed to the point from different things that people have said that we should be trying to mobilize for conferences several times a year in different areas of the country. Because what we found in this case, we found a lot of people in the area of Austin. It came from as far away as Galveston and Dallas and other parts of the state uh, that came to this uh, uh, event because they uh, wanted to be involved. And we got two new presenters. We Two people joined uh, Project Due Diligence out of the uh, people that came, uh, engineers. And then there's other people there that played a significant role in helping us with the uh, uh, setup and just anything that we needed in terms of support. So we can use these conferences as uh, organizing points for a particular area. Let's say, uh, you know, let's say there was a, we found out about a Congress, and there are many of these Congresses that take place with various engineering organizations across the country. We can go to these conferences, and we can bring in our local volunteers from the area that have signed our petition. We can advertise, take our message to the attendees, and recruit more presenters and build an organization around them that can help them carry out presentations in that area as we go forward. So now, for instance, we're in a much better position in Texas than we were before the Congress because now I've got 12, 15 people that I can connect that can now go forward to the ASE chapters and the other uh, professional engineering organizations in the area and uh, get this material in front of them. So it helps us in our organizing efforts in a very specific way, and we're learning as we're going along here how best to do this, and this is a very important lesson from us that came out of that uh, Congress. Now we're in our last few minutes here. We'll start with Larry. Do you guys have any final thoughts you want to leave with the audience? Well, I guess I would say, uh, yeah, uh, people need to listen to uh, look at the evidence, to not, I, I think a lot of people think this is such a huge problem and there's really nothing they can do about it because uh, they just don't have, the, have a position of influence. Well, that's not the way movements grow. Movements grow from the ground up, uh, person by person. You build a house brick by brick. And I find that, uh, oh, here's one little example. A friend of mine uh, has a granddaughter who just started college. And uh, she heard about uh, one of her high school teachers talked about 9-11. And when she got in college, one of her professors was talking about 9-11. And so this young lady uh, prepared a paper and gave a speech on 9-11, and she made reference to architects and engineers in her speech. She got an A on on her speech. That's just one little example, and it illustrates that, okay, the young generation, the people at college age, they're still aware and have some interest in this, and and I think people like me who are a couple generations removed uh, and people in between, Uh, we get every, we spread the word and we, we keep the interest going. And I think the movement will grow and eventually the, uh, the pressure will, will emerge. Recognition will emerge that something's not right here. This problem needs to be delved into in greater depth so that we understand what really happened we can correct whatever needs to be corrected and prevent this sort of thing from happening in the future. And the younger generation has to live with the world that evolves, and so they have an interest. Some of them have an interest. And 
So just remind people that we can make things happen if we decide to. Uh, if we decide it's too big of a problem for us, well, then, of course, nothing's going to happen. But talk it up, spread the word, take an interest, support those who delve into it, and um, we'll eventually get this uh, problem properly addressed. And it may take a while, but we'll get there. Yeah, 9-11 itself started off as an idea in somebody's head, some group of people planning something out of nothing and changing the world for the worse as a result of it. We can undo it beginning with a spark of thought and a few people's heads and the ambition to get it done and do what we need to do to restore the world as it should be. So I agree with you completely. Roland, any final thoughts? Every movement starts small, starts with an idea, starts with a few people, and it's a matter of momentum. If what you're saying has truth and validity, it will grow. It's just a matter of time. That's all it is. It's a matter of time and the persistence of those who continue to uh, adhere to it and push for it. And that's what we're doing. We're just following the truth. Uh, as one of the volunteers said to me, this is all going to be historical evidence. This, this is all going to come out in the end. We know that what we're saying is correct. There's no question about it. Nobody that opposes us is even willing to discuss it. So it's all going to be out there in the future at some point. Now, the engineering community can either be out in front of it, leading that discussion, or they can be behind it, uh, sticking their head in the sand and pretending that it doesn't exist. If we do the latter, it will look very, very bad for us, very bad. We will have lost the trust and confidence of the public to believe that we can design and build things that serve their interests. So we can't allow that to happen. We're fighting for the professional reputation of our community. And, of course, there are larger issues involved, and I don't want to make it seem like it's parochial, but we do have an interest first and foremost to our profession, and we need to carry it out. And people can help us by supporting us. It takes money. It takes various kinds of donations of time and effort. Uh, we've been very fortunate to get that. Uh, our trip was paid for by people that sent in money when we requested money. We uh, paid for it, and we made some more money besides. We need to do that because we're going to be doing this now on an ongoing basis for some time. These visits, these trips, these presentations, they all cost money. Money is a very practical matter. If you can't do anything else, you could always support AE 911 Truth by giving money and specify that it go to project due diligence. So we just keep going. It's a matter of momentum. Absolutely, and I know you guys got a lot of it. So I'm looking forward to the next big thing that you get done and uh, talking to you about it here on Free Fall. So, guys, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you, and thanks for getting the message out there. Um, Andy, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Andy, for having us on. Really appreciate your efforts. This program is on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also keep track of the archives by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele. So you have a great week, and good luck. Good luck.